I'm going to give you what I missed last week on the insecure leader. The Bible teaches in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the blood. I'm grateful to God that I don't have to work to be the type of person God wants me to be. But I want to talk about the danger zone of a person who is insecure. You know, I have a, a God-given, innate, passionate desire to see every person become a fully engaged, devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I so desire that each of you find out what it is you're here for and then just dive in, get plugged in, and let God use you. Man, if you're supposed to be teaching, I want to see you be the best teacher that God can make you to be. Take that one talent, two talent, five talents, whatever you are, and I mean wear it out. Just use it for Jesus. He's worthy of the service that you render in his dear name. If you're a singer, bless God sing. If you're an usher, ush. Whatever God's called you to do, I really think you ought to be doing it wholeheartedly. And I believe God does call us to do something. I'm not just here to breathe air and exist. I'm to live and I'm part of the body of Christ and I have God living inside of me and I can make a difference in this world. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do is talk to you about what I call the danger zone and I'm going to give you a danger of an insecure leader, somebody that's just in what they do, how they act around other people, uh, what their hold up is in life and being able to go on. And then I'm going to give you the benefit of being a secure leader. And so with that in mind, there's a danger zone in which insecure leaders eventually place themselves and their ministries in danger. If I was extremely insecure, I could place this ministry in danger. And I, I don't care who gets the credit. I just want God to be glorified. I want people to be reached. As one person said, I wish we could just check all of our egos and our logos at the door and uh, go in and just serve the Lord. So here's some symptoms of the danger zone of the insecure leader and that that individual creates. Number one, danger. Insecure leaders are really not leaders. Now I want you to listen to this. The question will be asked, why? You cannot lead people that you need. I couldn't lead this church if I just felt I needed you. I would be so insecure that I would be, I would be fearful that I may say something that would turn you off. And you know me, I would never say anything to anger anyone. I, I just want a real palatable message to keep everybody happy, happy, happy. One fellow said, I want to preach in such a way to make you want to go home and hug your poodle. So uh, insecure leaders are really not leaders. You cannot lead people that you need. Why? Because you need them to praise you. Leaders don't have people around them because they need them. Leaders have people around them so they can build into others. And so my sincere desire, I believe one of the fallacies in the mind of carnality is that when I challenge you to give, I believe you think I'm always trying to get something, almost as though I'm trying to get it for myself. And the bottom line is, I don't want what you've got. God's been more than fair to me, and what I want to do is spend my life seeing what I'm supposed to do in, in investing the resources God's given me instead of trying to get resources that belong to somebody else. So there's a danger there, uh, not being able to lead because you need those you lead. And I'm going to show you this in the life of Jesus. The benefit of the secure leader in this area is secure leaders love people, but they do not need them. You are there for them. You're there for them. That's why when someone said to me a few months ago, and I know you meant well, and I appreciate your sweet spirit, but someone said, boy, Pastor, you must really be disappointed you come in here and this building's full in the morning, and then you come back and, oh, you only get to speak to a couple thousand people on Sunday night. I know that must really just tug at your heart that there's not greater loyalty. I want to say something to you, friend. My joy and my relationship with the Son of God is not contingent on whether you come to Sunday night church. It's not even contingent whether you show up Sunday morning or not. My relationship with God is based on my own personal intimate knowledge of who he is in my life and what he wants to use me to do, regardless of where it's just this platform or whatever God wants me to do. Listen to this statement about Jesus in John 6, 66. 
From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? He's pretty secure, right? <laughs> In other words, he had given the challenge. He had told him it's going to cost the count. He had given him the high cost of discipleship, and many left him. If the rich young ruler had been at the average Baptist church and said, Pastor, what have I got to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And the pastor would have known what Jesus known, they'd have probably said, it would have probably made it a little easier for him. But instead, the Lord Jesus told him, well, go sell everything you've got and give it to the poor and come follow me. And the Bible says he left very sorrowful. Jesus didn't need him. He needed Jesus. And that's the way it is. With a leader, you're there because of what you believe God has placed in your life to pour into other people's lives. And so it's not that you're here for me tonight. I hope you're here for Christ. One lady this morning left the service weeping. God had really moved upon her heart. And she said, I was in this church. And she said, I begin to think in my heart, you know what I need to do? I need to go find me a small church where when the pastor sees me, he can call me by name. So she'd been over there and she talked about how her life, and this isn't always necessarily true, but she, her testimony is there's been a spiritual drought because she felt she needed a pastor to call her by her name. I want to be honest with you, I'm not intimidated by that. I never have been, never will be. For this simple reason, there's nowhere in the Bible that it teaches that the pastor ought to be able to call everybody by the name. The, the Bible does teach that it's my duty to so preach Jesus that hopefully you'll be able to call him by name. And he's the one we're to magnify. So I'm just not intimidated by some things that would cause me to become a very insecure person. And it can happen in our lives. Number two, danger. Insecure leaders don't provide security for those they lead. Man, you know, when you're secure and you just trust God, I mean, I'm not just talking about reckless abandonment, but there's just this attitude that God's going to see us through. God's going to help us. He always had, and we're going to trust him, and, uh, and he just does. But insecure leaders don't provide security for those they lead. You can't give what you don't possess. Now, what's the benefit of a secure leader? Secure leaders empower and appreciate others. <clears throat> I mean, I really, really do appreciate you all. I, mean, I really do. I, I, when you tell me there's something God's placed in your heart to do, I want to encourage you to do it. If, if God hadn't told me to stand with you in some way financially long run, I always try to at least give some type of gift, some type of encouragement, just to encourage you along and help provide security in what you believe it is God would have you to do. So to become an effective leader, you must make your followers feel good about themselves and what they're doing. And uh, I thank God for whatever you're doing. And I do trust you are doing something for the kingdom. There's a third danger. Insecure leaders take more from people than they give. Insecure leaders are takers and not givers. The attitude is always what's in it for me instead of what can I contribute. Let me be a part. I want in on this. See, insecure people are on a personal quest for validation and affirmation. Instead of giving validation and affirmation to their followers, they need to receive it from them because they're so insecure. You'll never see an insecure person bragging on other people unless there's something in it for them. But they won't just pay a compliment simply because it's just a true, outright compliment because they need all the compliments for themselves. Now, what's the benefit of a secure leader? Secure leaders contribute to the benefit of others. You want to help invest and pour into others. See, secure leaders do all they can to help others win. I gave you that one-liner. Gosh, I've heard it said so many times. I don't know who's original with it. But if you want to succeed in life, spend your life helping others succeed. You want to do well in life, spend your life helping others to do well. It's been said that if you will make much of Jesus, Jesus will make much of you. And so when you just make your mind up, I'm going to spend my life making much of God's son. I'm telling you, it just seems like God's son will make a lot of you. He'll use you. Well, the number four danger, insecure leaders limit the best people around them. They limit the best people around them. See, insecure leaders cannot genuinely celebrate victories won by others because they're jealous of them. You know, if you're not careful... This could happen with preachers or singers. You may just say, man, I, I don't want to preach behind that guy because maybe that person has a reputation of being very well prepared, very good in their delivery, very strong in their preaching. 
So you want to be as far away from them in the program as you can. Or you may say, man, I hope they don't place me behind that person singing because they're so good. That's just insecurity. If we're all here to praise the same person, it really doesn't matter how the other person before me or after does. And by the way, I ought to know, I've, I've followed many people and I thought they should have stopped with him after I started preaching. And I, I got to thinking, if they're not enjoying it any more than I am, we're in trouble. But what's the benefit of the secure leader? Secure leaders release their best people and allow them to go for it. You, you just trust God and encourage them to do their very best. See, secure leaders strive on seeing others succeed and love to see them reach their God-given potential. Man, I mean, with all the church planners we've got in this church and the missionaries that are in this church and have gone out of this church, man, I want to see every one of your ministries succeed. I really do. Uh, and it, one of the great blessings of my life, uh, my wife and I hosted uh, the evangelist and the people that are full-time missionaries that are in our church. We had 37 families at our house during Christmas. And what a, what a blessing of God to, be in, try, to attempt to be an encouragement to those who have a platform to attempt to encourage so many other people. What a blessing it is. Well, what's the number five danger? Insecure leaders limit their ministry, their organization, whatever they're leading, they limit it. It becomes limited. I was uh, doing a phone conference the other day. It uh, originated in uh, Michigan. And what you do, you go online and they had all these questions, seven questions they'd sent me to ask me. And then they had sent out this email blast all across the country to uh, ministers and you could go online and listen. And they were pastors on from Florida and Michigan and uh, all over the, the West. And it really was kind of an encouraging time. And there was a certain number they dialed. And then they could personally ask me a question when questions were uh, asked after. And they said to me, they said, Pastor Hunt, do you have an opinion on why most of our churches are small? For instance, in the state of Georgia, there's 3,480 Southern Baptist churches. The average attendance in those 3,480 so Southern Baptist churches is 147 and 107 in Bible study. Now, many of those are in the greater metroplex area. I mean, they're in areas of, of growth, growth and population. Why so many small churches? It's not just true here. It's true, true all across America. In major metropolitan, why are the churches? I believe because there's so many insecure, not just pastors, insecure leaders in those churches. An insecure leader brings a pastor in, and the pastor is real strong, and he begins to take the bull by the horns and lead the church. And it threatens the people. And they begin to say, well, we're going we're gonna to talk to him about that. He brought that preacher in without checking with us. Well, he ought to. He's the leader. But see, the issue is, is who's in charge? I was asked to teach at uh, Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary a couple years ago. My assignment was to deal with uh, church conflict and forced termination. And so I wrote three leadership lessons and went over there and addressed the, the state executive directors in our Southern Baptist Convention, plus that faculty and student body. Through the research, and Lifeway helped me with research, listen to this. The number one cause for conflict in Southern Baptist churches, and Baptist, just churches in large, is the word control. Everybody wants to be in control. But if you just come in and say, I'm going to be a servant leader, I mean, God's called me to lead, and I'm going to preach, and there'll be decisions I have to make. But I don't care if I lead anything. I just want to preach the gospel, love Jesus, love the people. Y'all all right? But, but I would limit, I would limit. I think that the average church stays way down in those numbers because they limit the growth of the organization and the church because they're so insecure. If you limit your best people, then you have no other resources than to limit your organization. The benefit? Secure leaders allow their organization to soar, to soar. Here's a great quote by a French novelist that I can't pronounce his name. Nothing is a greater impediment to being on good terms with others than being ill at ease with yourself. So let me, let me dive in. Let me just transition because I wrote that lesson and then this, this past year I wrote this new lesson I've got in my hand on the secure leader and I train leaders where they'll give me a platform to talk about uh, what the secure leader looks like. Many people want to lead, but really, actually, few people really ever do. And, and just, I mean, lead. Uh, many people think they're leading when few actually do. And by the way, 
Uh, being a leader is not standing up and saying, I'm in charge here. Matter of fact, anybody that has to say they're in charge are not. A leader is somebody God just raises up. He has a way of just lifting them out from among the others and just setting them up. The Bible says that God lifts one man up and God puts another down. God puts you in that place. You, it, you, matter of fact, for somebody that's so desirous for a place of leadership, they will probably be poor in more areas than they are good. But insecure leaders have an eye problem. An eye problem. And let me tell you what they are, and I'll give you these, and this will be a good place for me to stop and invite you to make a commitment. The first eye is inadequate. Here, here's how an insecure person feels deep inside. They have a hard time telling anyone else, but they're basically saying, I am insufficient when it comes to leadership. You never feel that you're secure. Now, I told you that my, my real struggles in the early days was with inferiority complex one of the things that gives me confidence in life is I know that I'm doing what God's called me to do and I know that God will help me I mean I really do I know know that God will help me and he's just proved that to me time and time again the second word of an insecure leader is inappreciable uh, too small to be noticed or make a significant difference and you know listen to this that's what's wrong with the average church member I wonder why the wisest man that ever lived on two different major occasions in the Proverbs said, consider the ant. But why would he pick something so small? And why would he pick something that had so little leadership? But all of them carry more than their own weight. And the reason I believe most people don't get involved in giving, they don't get involved in serving, don't get involved in sharing, is they feel they're too small to be noticed or to make a significant difference but honest before Almighty God, if all of us would do what God had gifted us to do, what an incredible difference it would make as we all did it together. Number three is incapable. I do not have the skills to pull this off. You don't need skills in the kingdom of God as much as you need God. It's when he places that special touch on your life that it makes the difference. I'm standing in the pastor's reception today, and I'm telling you the pastor's reception was glorious. One young man came in and he said, sir, I think you misunderstood me last week. And I always ask somebody when I meet them, I introduce myself and I say, so uh, where do you live and they're here in Woodstock? Well, is this your first time to Woodstock? And to which this young man, probably I'm going to guess him in his late 20s said, this is my first time ever in any church. I've never been to church. I thought, good night. Touch this dude. He had never been in church. And he said, but I wanted to come in here and talk to you. And I knew something was up then. He said, this morning, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I've been saved, and his wife was crying. So as soon as I walked away from him, another man came up, and he said, my wife came last week and came home and said she was saved. And she invited me, there it is, invited me to come today. And then he started choking up, and he said, and I feel like God's chiseling on me. <laughs> and two of our people took him out and led him to faith in Christ. I'm going to tell you, that's a good morning in the pastor's reception. If God can do that, don't ever feel that you're too small to be noticed or to make a significant difference. I want to tell you something. If you believe that, you've been lied to and you'd rather believe a lie than the truth of Almighty God. And you'll never make a significant difference with that mindset. Number four is the word incompetent. I do not have the knowledge to pull this off. You know, I went, I was privilege to go to college thank God for it made it through college did well went to seminary and and did fair in seminary depends on <laughs> who you ask but anyway did fair I, I made it through and uh and now I have three honorary doctorates somebody asked me every now and then where'd you earn your doctors I didn't their dds didn't do them and uh, <laughs> your pastor has three dds I appreciate the recognition uh, someone honor me thinking that we've done a commendable work and a school recognize you. That's great. But, but uh, I don't have to have the knowledge to pull it off. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of people that know a lot. But the question is, what do you do with what you know? I'd rather know less and do something with it than know a lot and do nothing with it. <laughs> Incompetent. Inconclusive which breeds a lack of clarity to others. I mean, live your life with purpose. Live your life with purpose. Whatever God's called you to do, whatever you feel like it is that you're to do, I mean, get focused on it and go and do it. 
and just minister. God willing, tomorrow night, I will be in Oklahoma City doing the Oklahoma State Evangelism Conference. And I'm telling you, I know exactly what God's put in my heart to preach for tomorrow night. And I will go there with great intention of challenging those dear pastors and ever who those messengers are to go in with God. And so um, I want to have clarity in my life. Here's something God said, and, and I want to be able to do it with such intention that I'm calling them to a particular commitment. This morning we gave the invitation. We'll know in a couple days what happened. And God really knows what happened. I'm telling you, there was a great host of people responding this morning. When we preached about bringing others to Christ, we we're intentional. You ought to be bringing people to Christ. The, the next word is the word incomplete. I do not have the total package. Question is, who does? Who does? Who has it all? Somebody says, I wish I could, I could sing like they sing. Well, I can't sing like they sing. So you know what I've decided to do? I'm going to sing like I sing. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sing it for the same person. I mean, it's almost like you think Jesus sitting there to saying now, now I like to hear them. I think he likes to hear praise from anyone's pure heart and clean hands when they lift it up to the Son of God. Inconsequential, without importance. Man, nobody hears without importance. You're so important, Jesus Christ died for you. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. How under God's heaven could you not be important when God paid so much for you? I mean, I thought that value was based on, on worth and worth or value. I mean, man, this costs something. And the other word is inferior. I'm not as good as others. Man, I'm telling you, I was there in my early days of ministry. Good night. I never felt I was as good as others. And then I found out I don't have to be as good as others. And most of the others now in my life that I want to be as good as, we're doing the same thing and on the same team. So it's more or less like tag team. And then the last word, and I'll pick up here next week, right on time. Inhibited. Restrained, suppressed. And uh, I know the only one that wants me to be suppressed or restrained is the one that's trying to keep me from doing what my life's call is, and that is to live my life to glorify God. And that's what I really want to do. I want to do that with intention. I want to take the resources God's given me, and I want to invest them. And when it, at the end of the day, I don't want it just to be all in my account and what I own, but I want to invest in others. I mean, it was a great deal of joy to invest in the Portugal ministry tonight. I'm telling you, it's a blessing under God to do that. And, and, it's, and it's a blessing also to stay out of debt so I can be free to go and do whatever God calls me to do and to obey him when he speaks to me about the resources that he's entrusted to me. And so I want to encourage you. Uh, if you didn't, if you were not here last week, I gave... 11 statements in closing last Sunday night after, in a 50-minute message. I gave you 11 statements in closing about that if you are insecure, here's some things you can do that God can begin to change you. And if you were not here, you ought to pick up the CD or DVD and listen to it. I want it to help you. I want us all to embrace his heart and his plan for our life and then be faithful. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, this has been a good day in the Lord. A good day of seeing men and women and boys and girls baptized into the family of God. Uh, people saved today. People uniting with our church, recommitting their life, answering God's call. It's just been a good day of celebration and music and, and the proclamation of the word. And great, great hours of Bible study under such talented and gifted communicators. And I just want to say bless you for the day. And I ask now in Jesus' name that you'd work mightily in our hearts. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to call for a commitment. And here's the commitment. I preached this morning two words, inviting others. And I want to ask you in the name of Jesus, every one of you, would no one leave here without at least three of the cards that says options on it. There's still some on the tables out there. Uh, and please, be intentional. Ask God, Lord Jesus, lay some soul upon my heart. Love that soul through me. God, give me the eyes to see someone this week that needs encouragement. Help me to reach out and just say to someone, hey, I'm Johnny. 
I go to First Baptist Church. I told, I was having lunch with Jim and Kathy and Jeremy today, and I said to a young uh, African-American named Chris, Chris, I'm Johnny. I want to invite you to come to church with me next week. I have an 11 o'clock service, brand new, would you come? He said, man, where are you? And I told him where we were, and he's, he said, I've passed that church there. And then another lady came up, and I said, I've been pleading with you to come, and next week, would you please come is my guess. Will they come? I don't know, but I'll guarantee if we ask enough, we're going to get some out there. I wonder if they thought I'd come that night when I was at Jacoby Hardware and N.W. Fridge and said at the Coca-Cola machine, John, you and Miss Hunt come to church with me one Sunday. And I came, and I've never been the same. God help you to invite a Simon to church next Sunday. I pray that we not be able to seat the people at 9.30 or 11 because tens of thousands of people would be invited. I know that sounds outrageous, but if everybody took my plea this morning, 6,000, and took 10 cards, 60,000 cards would be put in people's hands or families invited. So, so I encourage you to do that. So make a commitment. Uh, quit talking about what you can't do and allow God to do something with you this week. Feel good about the fact next week that you look up and there's a person sitting over there that you encourage to be here and God may change them for all eternity. So I pray that you'll do that. And then tonight, if you've not given your life to Christ, it could be through the sermon this morning. God really spoke to you since tonight. It was moral leadership. I would encourage you to respond to the message that you've heard, the gospel that you know. And then secondly, if you're visiting, you say, Pastor Johnny, we're sensing as a family, as an individual, this is the church God wants me to be a part of. Our doors are wide open. I want to encourage you to come and unite with our fellowship. Whatever you believe God's calling you to do, some other call on your life, I'll encourage you to come. Let's stand for prayers. We're standing, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, have your way in our life. Use us this week. Oh, God, may no one come to church empty-handed next week. May everyone come with a friend in hand, a family member in hand, a brother in hand. Oh, God, give us the heart of an Andrew that we're always bringing somebody to Jesus. Help us to be like Jesus and bring to Philip. Help us to be like Philip and bring Nathaniel. Help us to bring somebody for Christ's sake. Amen.